In this presentation, we continue our exploration of fast and slow thinking, and specifically the relation to the concept of cognitive biases. First of all, let's look at actually optical illusions as a tool to help us notice some of our fast thinking that's happening in our mind. For example, this optical illusion, to us it looks like squares A and B have different gray tones, but in fact they're actually the same gray tone. We can see this if we isolate these two squares away from their context, that really in fact they have the same gray tone, but really square A looks darker to us than square B. No matter what we no matter what we do, we can't really change it and see it differently. Here's another one. This usually looks very much like a face to us, but it's really just a picture of a mountain range on Mars. But basically no matter what we do, we see clearly see a face. We can't really change it even if we want to. And this is also a very typical optical illusion where we clearly see lines where there really aren't, not, aren't any. We see this white triangle here, but really there aren't any lines here, and yet they do somehow seem to show up in our mind. And so optical illusions are a great little tool because they help make our fast thinking visible to us. We clearly see what our mind is doing, and often we also experience that we cannot change it or see it differently, even if we know better. And so optical illusions are really a kind of a bigger type of a concept, namely cognitive biases. These are tendencies of our brain to perceive and interpret the world in a certain way. So also with cognitive biases, if we consider them kinds of human behaviors, we can ask why do we have them? What are their causes? And so again, as a reminder, we can use Tim Burton's questions as this framework to help us explore different kinds of causes of these biases. Let's look at one type of cause, the function of a behavior. So we can ask, do these cognitive biases have a function for us as organisms? Do they help us navigate and survive in the world in some way? Just as a side note, we should be aware of so-called adaptationism when we're exploring functions of behavior because really not all traits or behaviors necessarily have a function. They could just be some sort of side effect and not really there because they have evolved because of a important function. But many times we can in fact uh, think of many behaviors as being there, have, that we have them because they used to have or still have an important function for us. Let's look at the example of this face recognition that we saw in the optical illusion earlier. So it's our tendency that we recognize faces very easily. That's also why we have all these smiley faces and really just two dots and a line more or less we immediately kind of uh, interpret as a face. So let's think about what could be the function of our tendency to recognize such patterns as faces very easily. Why could this behavior be helpful? Think about some ideas, how would you answer these questions? Some things you might have come up with is that it can be helpful for us to notice predators and prey animals quickly, at least from our evolutionary history. So if there are certain animals in the bushes, we would very quickly notice them and also for us as social species, it can also be a good function because it helps us notice other people quickly and also their emotional states, the kind of facial expressions. So these might indeed be some important functions for why we actually have this kind of cognitive bias of, um, of recognizing faces very easily and quickly. Now on the other hand, even if behaviors have important functions, there can also be negative consequences for us under certain conditions. So again, for the example of face recognition, what could be some possible negative consequences for our ability or tendency to recognize faces easily? So 
something that you might have thought of is that possible negative consequence is that we could become just paranoid and scared because we might start to see faces everywhere and ghosts and things like this uh, in places where there really isn't anybody there. And so this can become harmful for our yeah, well-being. Another type of cause we can explore is the possible evolutionary history of a trait. So do we share this trait with other living things because of our common ancestry, common descent? And here again, for this ability for face recognition, um, this might indeed be a pretty old one in evolutionary terms and rather widespread among animals. And a hint for this is patterns like these. Namely, the fact that some animals have evolved patterns on their bodies that look like eyes, so-called eye spots, like in this moth here. And so evolutionary biologists think of different functions of this pattern, like m why might it have evolved? You can think about also what, what, what kind of ideas you have, but one of uh, the ideas is that these eye spots might distract or even deter predators because the pattern mimics the eyes of the predator's predator. For example, for this moth, a predator might be a mouse. And these eye spots are mimicking the eyes of an owl, which in turn is the predator of the mouse. And so the mouse would, instead of trying to go after this moth, would rather try to move away from it. Here's a sorting activity where you can explore a diversity of different cognitive biases that are also have some importance in our well-being and in sustainable development. And to sort and try to think about what are actually the functions, why might we have these biases in the first place, but then what are also some possible negative consequences of these biases. You can check out the actual activity template here and the full lesson plan as well. Here's a nice little reading, a suggested reading, where the authors really summarize a wide range of different biases that cognitive scientists and psychologists have identified. They are kind of uh, ordered here, uh, more like depending on the kind of functions that these biases might actually serve. So overall, they kind of really try to help us navigate in a quite complex world, which is full of information. And we have to a little bit select what is the important information and what's the meaning of the information. Also, this, the fact that we sometimes need to act fast and we just have to make a decision. And um, so these biases can also be helpful for this and to also sort out and select information that we should remember in our memory. So with these cognitive biases, the big question then becomes, what can we do to avoid or reduce the negative consequences that we have explored of these different kinds of biases? Also an important question is, how does the media, including social media, relate to our cognitive biases? Does the media make them actually have even worse consequences for us and for society? Or can the media also help us avoid or reduce the negative consequences of our cognitive biases. All these questions relate to the competency of critical thinking and ways how we might develop and foster this competency. Because this is indeed an important competency and learning goal in education in general, including in sustainability education. Some psychologists have defined um, critical thinking as thinking intended to overcome cognitive biases. So we see here the relation to the concept of cognitive biases. And importantly, critical thinking is not just exchanging one firm belief with another. So it's not enough to just switch your thinking instead of believing some kind of news or movement or person, you just switch to believing somebody else firmly. This is not what we would con consider critical thinking. So how can we develop and foster critical thinking? 
Well, overall, it's been very difficult to teach and cultivate it, especially across different kinds of domains and topics. So it's di been difficult to teach students how to think critically across different kinds of themes and, and topics. And this is because of some challenges that, again, have to do with our mind, basically. So first of all, we are mostly not aware of our biases. Like if you remember system one fast th thinking and certain biases in themselves, they make it very difficult for us to even be aware of our unconscious thinking processes. And they are at the same time constantly influencing us. The other problem is that certainty feels pretty good to us. You can reflect on why might this be the case. It again actually relates to a number of cognitive biases such as confirmation bias. It feels good for us to feel a sense of certainty and so we're not so motivated to put us in a situation where uncer uncertainty increases and we're not so sure anymore what to believe. Another big challenge is that uh, our beliefs and decisions in today's world often don't really have a direct and immediate consequence for us, for our own lives. There isn't really an immediate feedback and so no opportunity for direct learning from mistakes. For example, one could believe in a flat earth and other conspiracy theories without much danger or negative consequences to one's life. And so this doesn't really then force us to correct our beliefs. If anything, in fact, factually false beliefs can actually be adaptive. So, for example, it can help us belong to a certain group of like-minded people. Uh, it can help us be famous or popular in your group. If you're um, spreading certain beliefs that are popular, you can have many followers or be trending on social media and so on. So this, again, goes against the motivation to change our beliefs, even if they are false. So what can we do? Well, we can first of all train to and practice to notice and identify our biased thinking as well as our in including our sort of need and, and sense uh, for certainty. We can practice cultivating intellectual humility, meaning the ability to be okay with not being 100% certain. We can, because as humans, we are, whether we want it or not, always influenced by inf social information sources. And so we can try to seek and analyze claims of various, uh, including opposing and contradicting sources when we're trying to make up our own opinion about an issue. And when we're analyzing these sources, we should check for emotional content versus rather objectivity, check the background of the author, also the level of certainty that it is expressed by the author. The more certain the author seems to be, the more wary we should be about the claims. And in the same way, whether the authors consider alternatives and also take into account the complexity of an issue. We should also be aware of our so-called tribal mind. This relates to the theme of moral taste buds. So our tendency to really uh, seek out um, opinions that speak to our moral minds um, and, and how this also again tends to feel good to, add and, uh, to us and our tendency to also then feel a sense of disgust almost towards opinions that don't align with our moral tastes about issues. And we should also be aware of when to trust our intuitions and when to rather check in with system two when we're making up our opinions. To the last issue, Daniel Kahneman actually published something about this when they wanted, to, when the co-author wanted to find out when can humans actually trust our intuitions and, and when not. And so they came to the conclusion that intuitive judgments can be considered more or less reliable in situations when the environment is sufficiently regular and predictable meaning we have a lot of opportunity to, to learn this kind of regularity, such that we can actually build up our intuitions in a reliable way. 
if the environment is constantly different and changing, well, then we don't have the opportunity to to learn anything. And so we don't really build up any intuition about how the world works. Yeah, so the idea is only if the, we did have enough learning and practice in that environment, can we be saying that we have an intuition that is kind of expert knowledge. And so this includes then the environment we are born in, that we grow up in, and really becoming an expert after a long time. So only if people have spent a lot of time around an issue, learning about it, then these experts might have developed intuitions that really make them be right about something intuitively. But if you're not an expert, then we can say that um, without these opportunities to learn, an intuition, even if it might be true, can only be more due to a lucky accident. And finally, here's a tip for an open um, online program. This is Open Mind, an education program that's developed to help people understand their minds, take perspective, and cultivate constructive conversations about complex issues. You can find out more under this link. Music